Today we are going to continue our discussion on translation, the genetic code, and proteins. We're going to enter into the second part of our talk where we talk about the properties of the genetic code. Then I'd like to talk briefly about the structure and, fu and function of proteins. And then finally we'll conclude with the details, you know, the trees, and the big picture of the forest of the central dogma. And this will conclude the material on Unit 2. So let's enter into a discussion on the properties of the genetic code. This table here shows you the genetic code. And basically what it's saying is every three bases of RNA will encode for an amino acid. And so when you're looking things up on this chart, you basically have to pick, okay, what is the first base indicated on the left here? Is it U, C, A, or G? What's the second base? Again, you know, one of those four options. And then on the right-hand portion of the chart, what is the third base? So for example, if I were to give you the sequence A, U, G, you would say A, it has to occur somewhere in this quadrant, U, actually A, <laughs> somewhere in this, in this row, right? U, somewhere in this combination, so A and U, and then third base G, and then we get to this one cell right here, AUG methionine. You'll notice that uh, anything that encodes, or any three uh, bases of RNA is called a codon, and if they encode for an actual amino acid, it's called a sense codon. So pretty much everything here is a sense codon except for three options. If something doesn't encode for a codon, it has to encode for a stop codon. You see these two here, and you also see this one over here. So you see UAA, UAG, and UGA. Those three are stop codons, and we call those nonsense codons. So I'd write that word down, nonsense. If it encodes for a stop, it's nonsense. Any other amino acid is called a sense codon. Let's talk about some properties of the genetic code. The genetic code is called degenerate. We call it degenerate. Uh, what that means, another word for that is synonymous. And what these two words mean, degenerate and synonymous, they're just two different ways of saying that there's multiple codons that can encode for the same amino acid. Another word, another way to say it is there's redundancy in the genetic code. I'll give you an example. Leucine, right here, you can see is encoded for by any of these four codons in this cell, as well as other codons that are throughout the genome. So that redundancy or that degenerate nature of the genetic code or codons that are synonymous mean that, you know, there's a little play in the genetic code, we call it. So multiple codons can encode for the same amino acid. There's only two exceptions to this. The amino acid tryptophan and the amino acid methionine, if you look carefully on this chart, you'll see that they're only encoded for by one codon. So right here is tryptophan and here's methionine and you won't see them anywhere else on the chart. So this redundancy in the code actually results from something called the wobble effect. In other words, you'll notice that if we have our RNA strand here with this green line, again, five prime to three prime, you'll notice that we have our codon here and we have our tRNA, which is bringing our amino acids. And on the tRNA, we have our anticodon, which is, which is complementary to our codon. You'll notice a perfect pairing here, A with U, G with C, and G with C. However, sometimes the third base doesn't really matter. In other words, you'll get a pairing of an anticodon with a codon, even if the third base is not exactly correct. So here you see a U pairing with a G. That's the wobble effect. And that actually helps add to the redundancy of the genetic code. Let's talk about some more properties of the genetic code. So the genetic code is said to be non-overlapping. Uh, what we mean by this is that every three letters encodes for a given amino acid, and then the next three letters encode for the next amino acid. There's no overlapping between the codons. So if you look at the center portion of this slide, you'll see that here we have our RNA sequence, right? Here's one codon, here's another codon, here's another codon. And let's look down. This bottom portion is the correct way the genetic code reads. In other words, AUU will encode for the first amino acid. Then we're done with those three letters. The next three letters, GCU, encode for the next amino acid. Okay, then we're done with those letters. The next three encode for the third amino acid, and so on. You sort of get it. That's the reality of how the genetic code works. If we looked at what other options could have been, the genetic code could have been overlapping, which is not, but it could have been. And what that means is the first three letters encode for the next amino acid. Then we shift over one base. The last two um, uh, bases, 
of this codon actually help form the next amino acid too, along with the the next base that happens. So in other words, overlapping would be AUU is the first amino acid, shift over one base, and then UUG is the next amino acid. This is not how the genetic code functions. So again, we say the genetic code is non-overlapping. Some other properties. The genetic code is said to be punctuation-free. Uh, that's what your book will say. I'd slightly alter that. I'd say almost punctuation-free. In other words, what we mean by this is once you start a protein, you have one amino acid after the other, after the other. There's no uh, spaces, there's no gaps, there's no linkages where there's a lapse of an amino acid sequence, nothing like that. That's what we mean by punctuation free. Now I would say almost punctuation free uh, because there is a start, right? Methionine, AUG, and there is an end. So much like a sentence, there's a, a capital letter to start the sentence and there's a period to end of the sentence. So I think almost punctuation free is the better way to say it. Your book will also say the genetic code is universal. I would say it's almost universal. In other words, if you look at any organism on the planet, almost, right, they'll share this exact same chart. There are a few strange exceptions out there, like archaeobacteria as well as some other organisms. But for the most part, any organism on the planet, you look at, at them, and they will share the exact same genetic code here. So we'll say the genetic code is almost universal. Now there's a different, uh, some experiments that were done that crack the genetic code that show what three letters, right, or what codon encodes for what amino acid. This is an experiment we're not going to go through right now, uh, but I just want to show it to you. And if you are interested in learning more about it, please come to office hours. I'd be happy to explain it to you. Uh, but as far as the exam, as far as uh, testing material, I'm not going to test you on this slide, so we're going to skip over this. Quick clicker question. You could think of a codon as found on which type of nucleic acid? So think about it. Hopefully you're responding number two. Another concept check. There's only one possible three-letter combination that encodes for each amino acid. That's false, right? There's a lot of redundancy, as we first talked about, in the genetic code. This is a clicker uh, slide related to the experiment that we skipped. So you can just ignore this. You will not be tested on this material. So a few more slides we're going to skip to. Uh, please don't feel like we're skipping a lot of information here, but these slides are all pertaining to this single experiment that we're skipping. So that's why I'm skipping over several slides. So we're going to skip this slide too. You do not have to know this slide. Uh, again, skip this slide. Skip this slide. Okay. Now we're going to go on to the third part of the, uh, the lecture here. Again, all the slides we skipped are just pertaining to one specific experiment. So if you are curious about learning about that, I'd be happy to cover it over office hours, but it's not essential that we cover it for purposes of our exam. Okay, so let's go into the structure and function of proteins. Something that I think will be review from uh, your Intro to Bio courses, but nevertheless something that we should uh, touch upon. So proteins basically have a certain function, right? So many proteins are enzymes. They catalyze uh, metabolic reactions. Some proteins are antibodies, uh, some you know, are, are hormones, uh, some are transport molecules, and then there's cytoskeletal molecules as well, like lamina, the one we covered a few lectures ago. Really, they're the workhorses of living systems. So if you ever have a question on an exam, you're not sure what the answer is, people often joke, it's proteins. Uh, and that honestly is probably true most of the time. Uh, let's look at the structure of proteins. So they're a linear chain of amino acids, but we're going to cover the different structural levels uh, throughout this talk. Here's the basic structure of an amino acid. I would like you to know this. So this top portion right here, where my cursor is, I'd like you to know that. There's five main parts to an amino acid if we gave it a generic game plan. So every amino acid has essential carbon. That's, that's section one. They have a hydrogen group uh, that comes off that essential carbon. That's section two. These are probably the least interesting that we'll talk about. Every amino, or excuse me, every amino acid has an amino group, and then every amino acid has a carboxyl group. The amino groups and the carboxyl groups are, are linked together through peptide bonds when you connect one amino acid to another, to another, to another. Now each amino acid is identical to each other, so all 20 are identical, except for this group here, this side group. Uh, this side group is often called the R group. Uh, many people say R stands for the rest of the molecule, Really, that's not what it stands for, but it's a good way to think of it. Uh, in reality, the R group stands for the radical group. 
So this side group right here is termed the radical group. In other words, it's radical because it's the group that's different between each amino acid. So the side group, or the radical group, is what makes, for example, leucine different from serine, right? Uh, it makes leucine, and this is an error here, right? It makes leucine very hydro, actually, uh, Yep, that is an error, sorry. <laughs> makes leucine very, um, actually it's not an error, I'm sorry. Uh, it makes leucine very hydrophobic, right? Whereas serine here is very hydrophilic. So this is the error over here, let's just say hydrophilic. The R group, again, gives different amino acids unique properties. Um, I'm not going to make you memorize each of the 20 amino acids. Uh, that's something you do in cell biology, so I'll save it for that. Uh, you can look forward to that. Uh, but I do want you to know the generic uh, schematic of an amino acid that was on the top of the previous slide. Uh, but nevertheless, side groups can make amino acids polar. They can make them nonpolar. Uh, they can have uh, aromatic R groups, right, carbon rings. Some are negatively charged, some are positively charged. Amino acids are very interesting because when we think of all the differences between them, it really um, dictates the function of a protein. So in other words, all those things that we talked about in those previous slides, so here for example, um, if you have an, a, um, a protein that is on the surface of a cell membrane, you would think that it would have more hydrophilic uh, amino acids interacting on the outside or the inside of the cell membrane. However, if a protein is tunneling through the membrane, then you would expect to have more hydrophobic amino acids in that section. So, so the, the uh, qualities of the amino acids very much reflect the function and the location of the protein. So how are amino acids linked together? They're linked together through peptide bonds. You could see here as we lose water, right, through a condensation reaction, we link the carboxyl group on this amino acid with the amino group on this amino acid, right, again, losing water through a condensation reaction, and we form something called a peptide bond. So that's why proteins are often called polypeptides, right? Poly coming from the Greek word poly, uh, many peptide bonds. Proteins have asymmetric ends, you'll notice. In other words, uh, if this was a protein, right, we only have two amino acids here, but imagine, you know, maybe 600. Asymmetric because one, one end is the amino group and one end is the carboxyl group. Uh, it's very interesting, too, because when we talk about um, post-translational modifications, uh, some amino acids or some protein sequences are modified on the N-terminal end, which would be over here. Some are modified on the C-terminal end. It's an important thing that each end is, is modified respectively. We'll talk about that more at the end of this talk today. If you recall from intro to bio, you'll notice that proteins have four different structural levels. Uh, it's important that we know these. Again, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is probably a review, but you want to make sure that you know this. So the primary structural level of a protein is just saying what amino acids do you have and what order are they in? That, that's the primary level. The secondary level is saying how are these folded the first time? In other words, are they an alpha helix like you see here? Or are they a beta sheet? And a beta sheet would be going back and forth like a staircase, like this. The tertiary structure is if you take this secondary structure and imagine putting your hand here and your hand here and bending them together. So further bending of the secondary structure creates the tertiary structure. And within the tertiary structure, you get these regions interacting that were no longer interacting uh, before, or sorry, were not interacting before, and you get these pockets that form, something like this, something like this, these indentations. Uh, what we call them is we call them domains, a very important word that I would write down. So domains with a D. The different domains you see in the tertiary structure, these little pockets, these little uh, incroppings, are what allow proteins to interact with DNA sequences, with other proteins. Uh, they form these different binding domains, so very important. The final structure of the protein is the quaternary structure. And what that is, is that's just if you have multiple peptide strands coming together to form a larger protein complex. In other words, you have many, many subunits coming together to form a larger protein. Uh, that's a quaternary structure. So you need more than one strand to have that quaternary structure. All these structures are important, and um, we'll talk about them throughout our course, but they're always important in, the, in terms of the function and the location of the protein. Okay, finally, I'd like to just reflect upon the central dogma as a whole. Uh, we've talked a lot about the trees, a lot about the details. I'd like to end with the big picture uh, focus here of the central dogma, put it in perspective.
And to do this, I really want to um, focus on lamin A here. Again, we talked before about how lamin A, when you have a single uh, silent point mutation in the lamin A gene, so again, you want to know what single silent point mutation, what that is, what is a silent mutation. Uh, but when we have that, we get this phenotype that's very severe. So instead of getting a nice uh, oval type of uh, localization for lamin A just inside the nuclear membrane like you should, you have this lobulation of the lamin A where the nucleus has this cauliflower effect. Uh, again, sort of a model for human aging. And the thing that's interesting, again, is that a silent mutation can result in this effect. Um, it's interesting because you get this farnesylation of lamin A that you should not have. Again, we covered this in a previous lecture. And the thing that's interesting, again, is if we're going to study lamin A, we've got to be careful how we study it. Because a second ago, we talked about the N-terminal end, the C-terminal end of uh, proteins. The farnesyl group I mentioned to you before actually is added to the C-terminal end of lamin A. So if we're going to study lamin A using fluorescent versions of lamin A where we, you know, um, modify them so they glow in the cell, or I shouldn't say glow, but they fluoresce in the cell when you shine light on them. If we're going to study them, we got to make sure we're adding the red fluorescence on the right side. Otherwise, we're going to be affecting the function of the protein. So you could imagine that if the farnesyl group or the abnormal addition of the farnesyl group on lamin A is added to the C-terminal end, that we better be putting our red fluorescence on the N-terminal end to study it. So it's very important to understand that, you know, in terms of how it works. Um, another thing that's very interesting that we got to really remember is that when we talk about the central dogma, right, DNA being transcribed to RNA, RNA being translated to proteins, you could see how a silent point mutation that should not change the amino acid sequence, right, that's the definition of it, can result in such a mutation as you see here, or, or a phenotype as you see here, as, and the reason is, is because to get to the proteins, we have to go through the RNA, right, and what happens to RNA is it matures. Before it leaves the nucleus, RNA is going to be, what, modified on the 5' prime end with a 5' prime cap, on the 3' prime end with a poly A tail, and then what else happens? That last type of processing is called splicing. And the reason that a single point mutation in lamin A can yield such a severe phenotype is because the RNA, or the messenger RNA, is abnormally spliced. And so even though it shouldn't change the protein sequence, it does because the splicing is abnormal. You end up getting um, things spliced out that shouldn't be. And so the laminate protein ends up being smaller than it should be, and it ends up being frenesylated, and that's why you get this abnormal phenotype here. And you see individuals who seem like they're aging faster than they should.